welcome to Tanakh Talk. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with episode number 86 of Let's Get Biblical Q&A with Rabbi Tobia Singer from Jakarta, Indonesia. Rabbi, welcome, my friend and colleague, if you will. It's so good to see you again. I'll tell you what, it's um, it's always a pleasure, especially seeing, man, I don't know, every time I see you, I'm just totally amazed at one thing, and I'm sure everybody watching this always agrees. How oh, yeah. how do you have such perfect hair? <laughs> oh, really? Man, yeah, I your hair is just so smoking blessed. hot, man. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, you didn't catch that one, did you? <laughs> I, I'll oh. tell you, I, I am the last person to tell me my hair looks smoking hot yeah. <laughs> was about... 53 years ago, my mother told me that. And really? Since her, you're the next person. So I. I feel special. I, I, I feel special. Well, I think I should connect you and my mom and the two of you uh, get along just fine. My hair looks <laughs> okay. How do I have hair like that? I don't know. And to make you crazier, I just walk out of the shower. Put a brush over and walk out. It's amazing. Oh, that's just wrong. I'm very, I'm very gifted. The only way There's I can make my hair that successful is if I shave it down to like a one, like like a half inch of hair. Then all I have to do, I don't have yeah. to wash. I just take a rag and run it over my scalp. That works good, but it doesn't look uh, good. <laughs> I'm making a mental picture. It's not good. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My wife didn't think so either. Yeah. She said that, that yeah, she yeah. said she needed to have a man to put some hair on his head. So no, I, I just <sighs> I, this hair is because I. I prayed a lot and gave charity, and Hashem <laughs> saw it worthy and accounted it for righteousness. Um, so, yeah. you you were just full of it. That's all. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my yeah, gosh! <laughs> hey, that's all right. okay. Mm, that's all funny. Right. That's funny. That is yeah. too cool. Well, good well, deal. Well, I'll tell you what. It's good to see you again, of course. It's good to see all it, the viewers. Uh, um, it, phone lines are open, 855. I'll put the number on your screen now, 855-95-BIBLE. I translate 855-952-4253. 4253. It's, it's easy to remember the 855-95-BIBLE part, so it's kind of neat to write down. So, um, Wow. Okay. Well, let's see. I'm going to make sure... Uh, that my volume is up because uh, last week I've got a phone call from uh, coming in and I answered it and I couldn't hear them. It wasn't their fault. It was mine. I forgot to turn the volume back up. So um, we'll make sure we take care of that this week. So, all right. Well, Rabbi, let's kick off with the first question. Now, unless the caller calls in before I get this question out, uh, then we'll go ahead and stick with the question. If they call right after, then they, they will be able to just wait. So all you viewers out there, when you call in, remember that there may be a, a long wait hold. If you're waiting 10, 15 minutes, don't hang up because sometimes it's 20, 20 there you go, 20, 25. Whoa. Was that too loud for you? Let me turn it down. Oh yeah, that's better. Okay, good deal. Uh, so so uh, you may be on hold. So if you call in and you hang up, you're going to lose your place in line. I don't have a line up. And... And You're going to go to hell. <laughs> I, I I don't know how to tell you that, but you, you add gnashing of that's, teeth. That's I, that's I, what, it's an eternal sorry eternal hell. Right? Eternal, lake eternal, eternal lake of fire. Eternal lake of fire. Second Thessalonians one eight. There's no way around it. You know, you are a go good ahead. preacher, man. I'm just kidding. That's you know what's really funny. I shouldn't have said that because what's going to happen now? Some some anti semite is going to come on and they're going to take that one little clip up with you in the background and me saying you're a good preacher, man. And then they're going to post that as a mini sound clip, sound bite, and say, "See, he's blah blah blah." This is how this is how people work. This is the media for you, man. Social media can be just as brutal as it is a blessing. So, all right. Well, let's take this caller. Caller, welcome right. to the show. Um, please tell us your name and where you are calling from. Caller, can you hear us? I guess I should add, if you're on the phone, uh, you want to make sure you listen to our conversation through the phone call, not through the video, because there's about a 20-second delay. So, Caller, can you hear us yet? Yes. Okay, perfect. There Just we go. Out. All right. So... <laughs> okay, I didn't know I was on the air. Um, <laughs> my name is Alice. <laughs> my name is Alice Shack. I live in Oregon and the United States. And... Um, I was severely ill last summer, about July, and this gentleman brought me a book on the deeds and the creeds, I think it is, of the Jewish faith. But before that, 
I um, was interested in it and have been for a long time. And then the other day, my uh, niece, great niece, called me and told me that through my father, I was part Jewish. And I about fell over. But I want to tell you, I love this program. I'll never give it up. And I'm on it. I'm some. I'm some subscribed. But uh, I want to know in my area that we don't have a temple uh, to meet on Saturday. Um, I live in Eugene, uh, Springfield area where the Oregon Ducks are so famous. Uh, and I don't know what to do about attending, uh, not mass, but um, yes, temple. Right. I was a Catholic. Gotcha. Gotcha. So is your question, what is your question for the rabbi? What would you, what should you do since you have no place to attend? Is that kind of what you're asking? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Alice, thank you so much for calling in. It's good to hear uh, your voice. So uh, just go ahead and hang up now and you can tune in for the answer. Okay. All right. Thank you uh, okay. very much. Thanks for calling in. Bye. Okay. Awesome. Very good. Very good. Very good. Okay. So yeah, I get that question a lot and we do discuss it from time to time about every, I'm guessing maybe about every fourth or fifth video we get that question, but it's, it's really nice to be able to revisit that because there's so many people out there who haven't seen the other videos and may not even have time to watch them. Maybe they're watching for the first time and they have the same question. So uh, so like where we're at, we're, we're probably an hour and 45 minutes, Rabbi. Uh, from the nearest uh, synagogue of, that we would choose. And, of course, it's, that's that's tough for us. Um, but some people are even further away, three hours, four hours. And it's like, what's the best thing for them to do? I mean, is there, uh, especially the Noahide, I mean, if you're Jewish, is one thing. But if you're a Noahide, I mean, can they watch like uh, like shows like this all day long or go to Chabad.org and, and use their Internet and all this other stuff? What's the best thing for them to do? Yeah, well, you know, as it turns out, the word synagogue isn't in the Bible, uh, but the scripture does speak about uh, studying the Higisa by Yom Velayla, that a person should immerse themselves in the study of the Torah uh, day and night. We find that all over scripture. And in fact, it is Torah Sashem Tamima. It is the study of the Torah that makes us, uh, perfects us, and restores our soul and makes the foolish wise. So you're, if you're a Noahide, which means if you're not a Jewish, you're not a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the best of your knowledge, you're, in, in a sense, you're in, 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 in fabulous shape today compared to 50 years ago, because now you could spend your time online and watch my videos. No, just watch <laughs> videos of rabbis, you know, teaching Torah. This was completely inaccessible. I don't need to tell you that uh, that long ago. I, I, I will say that the, the great loss of not living anywhere near a synagogue is not so much attending a synagogue on Shabbat for, we're talking about for someone who's a Noahide, but really being a part of a Jewish community. I think that's important. I think um, we, we see in scripture, in messianic prophecy, that when the world reaches a state of perfection, that the nations will will stream to Jerusalem. Uh, the mountain of Jerusalem will be uh, made above all heights, and nations will stream up to it. Ki mitziyayin teitzei Torah, dvar Hashem Yerushalayim, for out of Zion will go forth the Torah and the word of Hashem uh, from Jerusalem. So we see there that it is important to those who are uh, B'nai Noah um, to connect to the Jewish people. So I, I, that's, I think, the big loss. Certainly, if you, 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 if you could, if you can attend the synagogue, if your mother's mother's mother is not Jewish, you can drive on the Sabbath. Um, but, if, it, but you should know that it's, it might be better for you to be home and study Torah. And that would be the best way to use your time. To And Shabbat is the time to think about that Hashem 
is the creator and sovereign master of the universe. And he created the world in six days and rested on the seventh and celebrate that. Um, the synagogue is, uh, is, 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 something, is something very special uh, because it's a house of prayer, but you can pray on your own. I think the major advantage of a synagogue is to be a part of the Jewish community. And I think that's what, when people call and say, you know, I'm so far from a synagogue, they're crying out in a way, I think, mm -hmm. saying, I feel so isolated and I, you know, I am, and I, I think that's a, that's a, a, a real concern, and you might want to consider, uh, you know, living near a, a Jewish community. So, and so that, was... with the same with the same concept, I know she mentioned that she that uh, her, she found out that she was partially Jewish through her father. What does that mean to her? Uh, to her, it means a, I, I can't read minds, but what it means to her is that she discovered that she has Jewish ancestry. Look, let's let's be clear. Um, there are, no doubt, far more uh, Jews who don't know they're Jewish than do know they're Jewish. Mm -hmm. This is not complicated. This is not some complicated theory. Um, throughout the last last. For thousands of years, Jewish people have been forced to convert to other religions. In particular, they were forced to convert to Christianity over the last 2,000 years. Or their Jewish people felt that their lives would be far better if they had... I mean, it, their lives would be far better if they had abandoned their faith and joined another religion. And in particular, in particular... In, in the Christian world, where Jews were, where Jewish life was uh, was intolerable. I mean, the nice Christians that you meet today, and they are, many of them are nice. This is not the way Christians behaved for 2,000 years. This is a, a, a rather recent phenomenon of, of deep, genuine affection for the Jewish people that essentially began in the late 19th century in the United States as a result of a, um, of a, of a, a movement of Christians who, who embraced a teaching of John Nelson Darby and were affected by um, Schofield and the Bible that was published in the early 20th century that uh, presented the Jewish people not as a rejected nation, and utterly jettisoned replacement theology, but rather present the Jewish people as a covenant nation, and God had never abandoned that nation, and that produced that in, that infused within the American Christian world a, an enormous amount of philo-Semitism, genuine uh, affection for the Jewish people, eventually Israel. So, um, but this was not. This was this is a very recent phenomenon. So the point is that hundreds of thousands of million we don't, no one even knows the numbers, but an enormous number of Jews have converted, and there are there are people walking around today all over the place who think they're not Jewish, who mm -hmm. find out they are. Now you know you're Jewish. Your your Jewish identity is decided by your mother, not by your father. That's what I was wondering. But we yeah. see yeah. that everywhere. In the Bible, go. Well, how do you know that? Well, I, well I'm a Jew. I should know. That. <laughs> how do you know? Well, but th there are countless instances all over Scripture where um, where you have an intermarriage. You have one person is Jewish and one is not. Uh, in every case where the mother is, Jew this incidentally happens to be true in the Christian Bible as well. In every case where the mother is Jewish, um, then the child is Jewish. Uh, in every case where the father is Jewish and the mother is not Jewish, the child is not considered a Jew. There are so many examples of this, Ezra chapter 10 and so on. Uh, the Bible tells us that if someone is your brother, you'll see it in Deuteronomy 13, he is the son of your mother. Now, I want to, so, the, but just because, because this woman indicated that she discovered that she's of Jewish ancestry through a father, that has nothing to do with, she very possibly 
um, uh, is Jewish through her mother. I mean, there, this is this. I, I remember years ago, uh, uh, Madeleine Albright, who was uh, Secretary of State. Uh, she had thought she was raised to believe that she wasn't Jewish. She was a Christian, and she discovered late in life that she was in fact Jewish. Uh, this is this uh, this happens around me constantly. Like people are discovering their Jewish identity. So, but if you know that your uh, mother is Jewish, then you're a Jew. If you're not aware of that, then you no obligation to do that. You know, you certainly know uh, no obligation to observe Jewish law. But uh, your Jewish identity, not your tribe identity, as far as what tribe you're from, that is that is your that is the source for that information is your father. Uh, Numbers chapter one verse eighteen, Lemishpachaisam, Levesavaisam. So if your father is a, uh, a a priest from the descent of Aaron, for example, then you are. If your father is from the house of David. Um, than you are. Uh, so your father determines your tribe identity and your mother determines your Jewish identity. But as I, I, I want to make this point, that the, in the center of Jewish life has always been a Jewish home. And the rabbi of that Jewish home is a Jewish woman, the mother of the Jewish people. We are here today because of the Noshim Shal Yisrael, the mothers, the women of Israel who have preserved our nation. And that's why, you know, in an Orthodox Jewish home in particular, I mean, that's my upbringing, the women were the ones who ensured that there was a, the home was Jewish. The woman, as it says in Proverbs 31, is the Tzaifiyah Halichos Beso. She is the one who oversees the home, the Jewish home. So the Jewish home is in the Bible. The Jewish synagogue is not in the Bible. So therefore, bring Judaism home. The biggest mistake people make is that they see a synagogue as a, that's where they do the things Jewish. Right. That's like a bank where you keep your money. That's where you go to do Jewish things. That's, a, this, that's the disaster for Jewish life in America. That's why there's such a problem. Judaism, Judaism must be home. That's the key. That's more important than any synagogue. So I encourage you to bring your faith and your relationship with God into your home. And thank you so much for calling in. What a great answer. Bring, yeah, bring the synagogue into your home, man. I'll tell you what, <laughs> that's, that's great advice. Every weekend, that's like the delight of our activities is my wife, she's always either got your books or she's got uh, the Midrash or whatever the case may be, just following up with the Chumash. And it is, uh, I mean, it's an all-day thing. So it's like a complete day of just feasting, and it's really, really, really oh, yeah. wonderful. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Okay, well, let's take this next caller. Caller, please tell us your name and where you're calling from. First, please turn down your monitor, if you don't mind. Yes, uh, my name is Jim. Hi, Jim. How are you? I'm doing well today. Thank you. Good. I'm calling I'm calling you from Reading, Pennsylvania. Okay. With a a question for Rabbi about uh, a provision in Parshas Bashalak. Okay. In particular chapter 14 of Shemot verses 5 through 9 which describe the chronology of the departure of uh, the people of Israel and pharaohs following of them and the commentary in um, the humash has it set for a six-day commentary and i wanted to ask rabbi if he would be kind enough to explicate his understanding of these verses uh, how far um, a people of that size would move per day in those times mm. and what he might think of as the likely site of the crossing interesting rabbi do you want to did you get that this question pretty a, well? This is, yeah, this is a very good question. Okay. So in Exodus... Um, Let's go ahead and disconnect. I just want to make sure Rabbi got your questions clear. Uh, we'll disconnect, uh, and thank you, Jim, for calling in. Just tune in for the answer, okay? okay. Certainly. Bye-bye. You bet. Bye-bye. Okay, cool. Okay, so let's re reach... There was two questions there, right? Uh, if you would, Rabbi, just kind of re rephrase them for me so that I can put them in a simple format so I can have them documented. 
Um, so what we what comes into view in Exodus chapter 14, the Jewish people have fled Egypt back in Exodus 12, two chapters earlier. Um, word gets back to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, that the Jewish people are not returning. And here Pharaoh's heart is hardened once again. And he makes the astonishing decision to actually chase after the Jewish people after enduring 10 plagues. And the purpose of all this, as we're told in Scripture, is that the glory of God would be shown. And the nation then flees. Uh, we, we're told quite a bit about their flight. Their flight would not... Logically, if you were leaving Egypt and you wanted to make your way to the land of Israel... Um, it, it doesn't. You don't have to be a you know win all kinds of geography contests to figure out that you want to go straight north. I've done that. I've been to Egypt and I've gone to the land of right, Israel right. direct. It's straight north. Just take my word for it right now. Uh, but the Torah tells us that Kodesh Baruch the Holy One, blessed be His name, didn't take the children of Israel on a straight northerly right. path because the nation had just come out of slavery. Uh, it. And they had a slave mentality. They were weak, emotionally weak, spiritually weak, and they would not be able to face down the Philistines. The Philistines would have fought like mad at that point. The reason is, is that the Philistines actually lived in the land of Israel. So they will be fighting for their own place, for their own land. They would they would, they would fight very, very hard. So the Almighty didn't take them in that direction. Uh, but what we... Hear, so this goes now to the next day. So we're taken in a different direction. Uh, and, and we don't know the exact place of the crossing of the Jewish people uh, across the Red Sea, which took place on the seventh day. That means the last day of Passover marks the day that the Jewish people cross the sea on dry land. The only, th the, huh. so I, I, I did a few shows on this where there's a, uh, there was a theory that was well, more than a theory. There was an assertion made um, by a, a Christian who apparently, in maybe let's say the 1990s, let's say it was 20, 25 years ago. Um, of where the Jews could have crossed. So this gets really interesting, because uh, as it turns out, I, I'm, a, I'm a scuba diver, an avid scuba diver, and I, I probably logged, I don't, I don't really know, uh, but many hundreds of dives in the Red Sea. And the Red Sea is, it's not hard to dive, but you have to be pretty good, and you have to show that you, you have a lot of experience, because of de the Red Sea is all wall dives means there's nothing below you. It's a, it's a straight... That means when you go off the edge in the Red Sea, you, it's straight down. It, and it is, if you look up, I don't... You know, the, the Red Sea is probably... I'm not off by far, probably 2,200 kilometers long and north-south, and its deepest parts could be... 10 miles deep. It's a very deep place. So therefore, when you're, when you're diving, one of the things that's very striking is that there's nothing below you. It's just blue. And, and all you have as your orientation is the wall of, of whatever it is, you know, wherever you are. You're looking at the wall and you have your dive computer. And that's why they, it's the only place I think in the world you have to demonstrate that you have at least 50, log 50 dives in the last two years if you're in open water diving. Because you really need some experience because you can get, if you just are snapped into the blue, you, all you see is blue underwater and then you have no orientation. So with a little experience, you're fine. The, where I'm going with all this is the following. The Jews could not have crossed anywhere. They couldn't have crossed anywhere because it actually been much easier to cross by boat because it, it's not where it's sort of a nice slope across the Red Sea and then you just sort of come out on the other side. 
but it's a drop of a cliff that goes down miles. So if, 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 if with the sea parts, there better be dry land. And the Bible tells us that, and we're told this over and over in Scripture, that the Almighty brought us on a on a path of dry ground. And we find a very beautiful passage like that in the book of Isaiah as well. So there are, there are not that many places where you can cross the Red Sea where there is a path that's, only, that's rather shallow, that's no more than 200 feet. And it would have to be one of those crossings that would, that the Jews would have gone across. I was at one time saw um, it was a, a Christian. His name escapes me, um, who took a team apparently of divers and went to one of these crossings, and found um, remnants of uh, Egyptian chariots, particularly in particular their. Uh, the, the wheels, the spokes, the axles are in, intact with the, with coral encrustation, what you'd expect. They date roughly 3,000 years old. But then other people come along there and said uh, that uh, that's very unlikely. I will say this point. I'll just say this part is the Jews are not really interested. I mean, we're curious like everybody, but we're not we're not big relic people. We're not big on like we're like we're not trying to sneak into Jordan we don't have to sneak in you, know, you can uh, Jews can go to the uh, the country to Jordan and see like the mountain where there's a tradition that Moses was buried and and so on we, we, but we're not flocking there it's not it's really not that important to us what is the way when we look at um, Genesis 14 5 and 6 is we don't look at it that way what we're interested in is not when they cross. We're interested in the fact that the Jews had a, you read all the commentaries, the Jews had a, a, a slave mentality, very much like, I think, um, when I was, I was born 15 years after the Holocaust. So growing up in New York, there was survivors all around me. All the, I mean, it was just everywhere. Um, you know, all my neighbors and so on, you know, they had the numbers and so on. And when you, when I, and when I would ask them, what was it like? Cause I was very curious as a youngster and I somehow had an awareness that one day they wouldn't be there to tell, to tell it. And I would need to tell this story for them. And I asked them, what was it like? And they would just look at me. I'll never forget that. I, I would, as a youngster, I would ask an elderly woman or elderly man who survived Auschwitz, and I, and I, I really want to know what was a day like, what what was this experience like, and they would just look at me, and I don't remember the words, but what they were conveying is there there are no there are no words. It was only later, I think, after the film Schindler's List came out, that uh, survivors became more articulate and able to better convey. There was silence was usually, I, 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 what, how can I describe to you? And I always felt, it was, so that was kind of the mentality of the, the Jew coming out of a, such a long time out of slavery, out of Egypt, that the Jew had a slave mentality and they were a weakened nation. And we see it over and over and over again. Now, what we find very curious when we study the passages in, in Exodus 14, 5, and 6, just so you know how I think about it is, I think about where did Pharaoh acquire these horses and, and these 600 chariots? That means he had 600 chariots with horses that raced after the Jewish people and ultimately... Uh, went into the sea and where did those horses come from and you go what do you mean why why would egypt is well known for having horses but they the horses would have been killed in the plagues in egypt because there was a plague uh, against the animals that killed them uh there was hail that was fire that would have killed the livestock of the egyptians so where the heck did they get these horses from 
the, what is so intriguing to the Jew when studying these passages, and this is, our literature is pregnant with this type of thinking is, uh, is that the only animals that would have been spared of the plague in Egypt, or these plagues in Egypt that would have affected um, uh, livestock, is if the people in Egypt feared uh, what Moses' warning and would have brought their horses inside their stable, if they would have brought them indoors, they would have survived. Which means that the people who supplied the horses for the Egyptian army were the best of the Egyptians, were the nicest people. That were, they were the best of our enemies, so to speak. And yet when it came down to it, they said, here's our horses, go chase down the Jews. So to us, we are, yes, we do have a, we have instances where the Jewish people stop, Sukkot, and so on. But the, we don't know the exact place of the crossing. There are a number of theories. It would have to be a place where there's a mesila, where there's a pathway that's not um, two miles deep, but one that's only 150 feet deep, and there are a number of such places, and there are a number of films been done on that, and I encourage you to do that. But that's not, I will tell you that in all my years of yeshiva, we never thought of it that way. We just, we were very interested in what is each one of these passages trying to convey? Uh, what we would think about, I'll just share another thought with you, is like, like, why did, like, the night before the sea parted, an east wind came and blew all night. An angel was there that protected the Jewish people from the arrows of the Egyptians, and it was a, a cloud there that, that uh, surrounded the nation and so on, but, like, why? 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 Why all this? Why did it take so long? Why didn't God just kill out the Egyptians as soon as they started going after the Jews? Why not just kill them right there? I mean, if they, they're going after the Jews, why wait? Why give them more time and more time? And then a whole night of blowing wind. Why this whole night of wind blowing? And until finally the next day the Jews pass through and the Egyptians follow and the, the sea collapses on the Egyptian army and they perish. And the answer is that to the last second, God wanted to give the Egyptians an opportunity to repent, to do tshuva. And uh, even to the last second, Pharaoh and his army could have repented. They didn't, and they therefore perished. Those are the kinds of things that, uh, that our sages of blessed memory and Jews to this day really uh, think about a lot. As far as the area of the passing is just curious to me because I've I, I've been fortunate enough to dive almost every part of the Red Sea, well, north of the Sudan. So, um, so that would be the answer for you. But uh, we're very interested in the text. Right, gotcha. I know it's a big controversy for sure on, on where the crossing was, and a lot of people use that whole idea of volume, uh, the volume of people, uh, in, in a way to discredit, to say there's no way that could have possibly happened because there's too many people, but yeah, it's good to know. Okay, so we'll take this next caller. Well, that just yes. is a point. Those are always weak questions. Oh, gotcha. That's called an external question. I mean, that's like, how did God get kangaroos on Noah's Ark? Well, he's God <laughs> can do that. <laughs> you know, those are those are not the important. I, I apologize if that is your question. The the penetrating questions are the internal questions, not the external questions. Gotcha. But bless your heart. Let's go to the next call. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Shalom, uh, Will. Shalom, Tobia. This is Sean with uh, in Libby, Montana. How you guys doing? Hey, Sean. Welcome back to the show. How are you, man? Hey, it's a beautiful day. I'm blessed. I'm so thankful for you guys. And um, unfortunately, I was on the phone the entire time, and Toby just answered, well, kind of answered my question. I was going to ask how oh. kangaroos got on the ark. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Oh, my gosh. This is so, great. This is part of my highlight of the show. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, I'm actually touching base again about the question last week. I think I, I spoke so quickly and so fast and rambled that it's still been driving me nuts this week. So I'm just going to give you the places and i just want a clear understanding on whether or not god does change his mind will change his mind if he has or ever will in exodus 32 verse 14 in my uh new american standard bible it says god changed his mind um in my art scroll 
it says Hashem reconsidered. And then in these other two verses, Amos 7, verse 3 and 6, it says God relented. In my New American Standard Bible, it still is translated as changed his mind. So my question is, is whether or not God does change his mind. And um, I'd love to have a clear understanding um, uh, of whether or not he does or does not. Okay, great. Now, I think uh, either a week or two ago, we did discuss this. Have you seen a couple of recent episodes, Sean, by chance? Um, yeah, I generally watch them. Okay, um, okay, so... Maybe so I missed it. Maybe, maybe. And also, you'll want to check out the Google Drive link that I posted for everybody that's got all the topics. It'll tell you what video number it is and what where to find it if the, if it's been discussed also. So after today, if you want to go back and look at it to get more input, that'll be a good resource for you, okay? Perfect, yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, I've, I've searched quite a bit online as well as... Okay. ...for Tovia directly on whether God changed his mind. There's a few... But it didn't really touch on whether or not. I mean, I've read both both ways, yes and no. So, and I, I trust in. I want to know what God says, but awesome. I also trust in Tobia's opinion. So that's why I figured I was calling and asked. That's great. Okay, Sean, thank you for the question. Let's go ahead and disconnect, and he'll get right on it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, there yeah. you go, Rabbi. Okay. Time to put on the magnifying so, glass and zoom yeah, into this there baby. There are a lot of passages there. Um, uh, uh, may, Hmm. Let me think which one to pick. I, I think um, let's take uh, Exodus 32. Um, and I, I'm just thinking of a passage that a lot of people will be familiar with. Exodus 32 is uh, recounts a, a it's a, it's a, a very difficult chapter. It's a chapter where I can only imagine. You know, I, I'm just playing this in my head as Moses is on the mountain with the Almighty to receive the Ten Commandments and God informs Moses that um, that the Jewish people had made a, a, a golden calf and God said to Moses it's very intriguing passages the Almighty said to Moses, um, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but leave my sight, go away, and I will destroy the nation. God will build up a new nation through Moses. But leave my presence, God said. So let's just set this all up. It, it, this is one of the most intriguing passages in the whole Torah. I remember in our congregation when last year when we were studying this, because in in Shabbat in my synagogue, we after prayers and after we have Shabbat lunch together, we spend the whole day studying Torah, and we spent an I think we spent the entire Shabbat. I mean, four or five hours. Uh, studying this passage, and I, I my congregation, within a, a few weeks, members of my congregation could read Hebrew, and I show them why it's important to read Hebrew because you won't understand the text, but the Hebrew of the text might help us here. So as it turns out, so let's think this through. Mo Moses is up on the mountain with God; he's alone. The nation, based on a miscalculation, had assumed that Moses would have already come down. Uh, they wanted to replace Moses with something else. Their dependency on Moses, we saw already in Exodus 20, 18, was too great. Moses was already concerned about this. There was the heir of the mixed multitude who further... Um, made the situation worse because it's the Jews, some Jews, as it turns out, uh, 3,000 of them, we'll find out later, had engaged in this. So it wasn't all the Jews. It was a small number. But it was still, a, this was a disaster. Uh, but the Arab Rav, the mixed multitude, these were non-Jews who had joined the Jewish people, said, uh, th pointed to this Egel Hazava's golden cap and said, this is your God who took you out of Egypt. That's how we know 
these weren't Jews, because it's saying this is your God who took you out of Egypt. I mean, what, what a disaster this was. And God, uh, God says to Moses, leave my presence. You, it's very important you pay attention to every part, everything I'm about to say, or else you won't get it. So God says to Moses, leave my presence. I will destroy the entire nation and start over with you. Okay? Now, Moses, a blessed memory. What a great man. So he wouldn't be, he wouldn't have any of that. And he has to make a case to God of why you shouldn't do this. If you read the English translation of Exodus 32, and I want to look at verse 11 a lot with you, and I want to just let the, the words drip through your mind. If you look at a translation, you're in a lot of trouble. If you look at a translation, what Moses is here now has suddenly become, in a way, the defense attorney of the Jewish people to prevent this from happening. What kind of a case can you make? Now, Moses, one might say, well, Moses maybe would run down the mountain, tell the Jews what they're doing is terrible, get them to stop doing it, to repent, and then he can go back up to God and say to them, okay, they repented and God might forgive them. But listen carefully to what the Almighty, uh, blessed be his holy name, said to Moses, leave my presence so I could destroy the Jewish people. So Moses, of course, is going, well, that means if I don't leave your presence, you won't destroy the Jews. So Moses is stuck. Imagine this. Moses is alone with the Almighty on Mount Sinai. Alone. Just Moses and God. And Moses can't leave the presence of the Almighty. Because if he leaves, then God carries that out. He can't, therefore, Moses cannot go to the people have them repent, and then God will forgive them as the Almighty has forgiven others who had repented. Okay? So imagine that you're in this position, and you have to now make a case to God for why God should not destroy the Jewish people. And if you read the text, I think you'll probably fall over in English. If you're in Hebrew, it's... Mm, so, in fact, the Jewish people deserve to get it. And, but if you read it in English, so the English translation will be, the Hebrew says, Loma Hashem Yechra Ba'apcha Ba'amecha Asher Tzisich Emer Tzrayim B'Koyach Godel V'Yod Chazaka Which means essentially, now here's how the translation goes. Why are God, are you angry with your people whom you took out of Egypt with great power and might. Now, if you're reading this in English, you are doomed. And you're going to ask the question of why would God change his mind? You're going to ask the question, as much as you love Moses of blessed memory, our teacher, you're going to go, that sounds like the worst possible defense. I mean, if you had an attorney who made that kind of case in a courtroom to a judge, you'd fire him. <laughs> what do you mean, why are you angry? Of course you're angry. The Jews made a golden calf. Okay, you got it? So why would that get, God then, what, what would change God's mind? Meaning, why would God come, why would God change the outcome here? This is, it seems, in a translation, really a, an awful defense, the worst possible thing you could say. Repeat the why verse. are you angry? Okay, so that's why then we don't get of, of what does it mean that God, that God turned and took a new direction. If you look at the Hebrew, you'll discover something quite yummy, and then you're going to work really hard to learn your biblical Hebrew. Please repeat really the Hebrew verse language. for us. The chapter and verse okay. again. Uh, it's Exodus chapter 32, verse 11. Thank you. Yeah. So it says, it begins by saying, by Yechal Moshe, as Pnei Hashem Elokov, and Moses entreated the Almighty um, 
And then it says, so the word, now, I said a moment ago that Hebrew is a very tiny language. I'm talking about the biblical Hebrew. It's very, very small vocabulary. And it is, therefore, extremely precise. It's not like English where you have 40 words to say the same thing and another 100 words that you never heard of in your life. Hebrew is a very small language, an extremely precise language, and we don't really have two words that really mean the exact same thing. They may appear superficially to be the same thing, and they definitely get translated the same way, but they actually mean something completely different. So... Moshe Rabbeinu said, Moses, our teacher, said, Loma Hashem Yechov Apacha, which, now, the word Loma means your translation has to be something like, why? Why are you angry? Okay? okay. Why, is your, why is your anger against uh, your nation? But as it turns out, so that raises the question of Moses is going to reason with God of why he shouldn't be angry. And therefore, when you see that God changed his mind, it means that God went, you know, I, I guess I, I shouldn't have been angry after all. It was a mistake to be angry. Got it? And then the question arises, what do you mean? Like God, God can't go, well, you know, I didn't think of that. Okay, got it? All right. But if you look at the at Lush Nakodesh, the, the holy tongue, you'll see where this is really quite delicious. In fact, God never changed his mind. Now Moses, he, he, was, he was Moshe Rabbeinu. He was tested here to defend the Jewish people. And he does this in a totally different way. And if you want to know how to pray to God, Moses is the one to learn from. So as it turns out, there are two ways in Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, to say why. Why? To ask the question why, there are two ways in Hebrew you could do that. One way is in our text, lama, means why. And there's another word, mad, madua. Madua means why. There are two entirely different words, two entirely different roots, and they get translated the exact same way, and that's a disaster. This is why you have to be in deep in Hebrew. Once you understand the difference, you understand that God didn't change his mind, but God rather used a measure based on a completely different equation. And I'll explain. Because it really wouldn't... First, let me explain the difference between madua and lama. The word madua means is a question, a why question for information. Why is the sky blue? Madua. That means I don't have information. I don't know the answer. I don't, and I need that answer. In fact, the word for science is Mada. Uh, it, madua is a question of why. You know, uh, why does why you know why you know why does why do things go down? Why in space do things float? Why? I say I need information that I don't have. And that's what madua is. It's I'm looking for dot. I'm looking for knowledge, which I don't have. That is not Moses' question. That would be a ridiculous question. What do you mean? I need to, I want to know the reason why you're angry. And then Mo, that's an outrageous question. Of course God is angry. The, there is another why question, word for why, and that's the one that's employed in this passage where the Almighty says, Lo Hashem yechrov apcha ba'amecha. And the word lama does not, is not asking for why, like, I don't, like, why are you angry? No. The word lama means lema, which means to what end? Where is this going to lead? Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses is a blessed memory, I say I miss him because I'm so. I, I when I read his words, when I think about his conversation with Hakadosh Baruch Hu, I, I I hope I'll merit to see him in the resurrection. So he he says something. He he makes two cases for why God should not destroy the Jewish people, and it's not a change of mind, but it's ra rather it's to raise the glory of Hashem. 
And the two reasons, he's going to say is to what ends. That's what Lama means. Lama always means to what end will this serve? What will be the result? And Moses, a blessed memory, says, says, makes two points. Number one, what is the world going to say? What will the Egyptians say? What will the nation say? Imagine that. The Jews were taken out of Egypt, were were slave were over a course of nearly a year of plagues and wonders and signs. The Jews were taken out of out of uh, Mitzrayim. They were brought into the wilderness. They crossed the sea on dry land. The Egyptian army was destroyed, and then only then did the God just wipes out the very Jews that He saved. What will the nation say? Meaning that it will not raise up your name, and that your name must be raised up above every other name. It's incidentally the exact case that the greatest Davidic king ever, who ever lived, Hezekiah, made to God to save Jerusalem from Sancher, from Assyria. And that is that if Jerusalem is destroyed, what will the nation say? It will not raise up your name. If I say this to you, um, the, the listener, if you're wondering why some prayers are not being answered, um, well, maybe they're just you're just asking for the wrong things. But it's very important to to when asking Hashem, uh, pleading with Him, it's for His glory, not for yours. Moses makes this case that number one, the, the world will say the. Those who were back in Egypt who survived, the women and so on, world will get out. But the God of the Jews killed out the Jews, and what it will therefore defile and desecrate the name of Hashem. That's point one. Point two is that Hakadosh Baruch Hu, uh, made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses will say, and the promise is that the nation of Israel will be an eternal nation, a nation whose numbers cannot be counted. And if the nation is only preserved, if I, if the nation is wiped out and it just comes through me, that's not going to be the outcome. And therefore, once again, your name will not be glorified. So Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Ah, Hakadosh Baruch Hu, blessed be His name. Moses, in a sense, passed this this test. Moses was able to defend the children of Israel, and it's it's not that God didn't know what kind of a person Moses was, but it's this it, this conversation is recorded for what purpose? Why do we need to know it? As it turns out, Moses is going to come down the mountain. Is going to be when he sees the Jews dancing around the golden calf, he's going to be enraged. He's going to throw down, destroy the tablets. Uh, Three thousand Jews are going to be killed for what they had done. Uh, just. No, there were millions of Jews there, but it doesn't make a difference. Uh, the key is that Moses is enraged. But w why do I need this conversation? How, what, how does that conversation, it was a private conversation between God and Moses, how does, what does that do for me? Now, if it's in Torah, it means it has eternal, it's an eternal teaching. It, it means something to me today. And that is it teaching me how to pray. And that is that God never changes his mind, but rather we raise up God's name. And as a result, God then changes history in a very special way. So um, the, the language that's used here in the Hebrew uh, betrays that, displays God's glory, Mo the case that Moses made. And now everything makes sense. Moses wasn't explaining why the uh, why the anger of God was not just that God will never change. What Moses was displaying is what would be the result of this, and very important, your name will not be raised up. Your glory will not be displayed. And after all, wasn't that the purpose of the Exodus? God could didn't need this whole Exodus deal. He could have. Moses, God didn't need Pharaoh's permission to 
redeemed the Jewish people. He didn't need ten plagues. He could have done it in one. He could have just killed. All of this was to display the glory of Hashem. Incidentally, and just to so I'm just going to use that as an example. Um, uh, that is, uh, we see in the War of Gog and Magog, the end time war, in Ezekiel 38 and 39. That that also was the purpose, as in Zechariah 14. A kind of parallel chapter because it's also the same end time war that its purpose is to display the glory of Hashem that all the nations will see and be able to point to the glory of Hashem. That's its purpose. So it's, but what I told you is masked completely by the, by any translation, meaning the best translation possible can't, dis, can't convey what I've shared with you. Because it just won't translate. That distinction doesn't doesn't exist in the English language. You'd need a lot of commentary to put this all together. You'd have to have an intimate understanding of the language. This is why, my friends, learn biblical Hebrew. That's all I can say. It really is not difficult. Get yourself a teacher. There are so many people out there who are teaching it. It really is worth it. And I know, William, you're doing you do a show on learning Hebrew. Yes, sir. So, um, I, if you don't learn Hebrew, it, it's not like you don't get the nuance. It's not like I'm telling you, 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 instead of seeing the movie in color, you're watching in black and white. It's not like you're not getting 4K. You don't understand what's going on. You don't mm-hmm. understand the conversation. You don't understand the shot, the basic meaning of the text. I hope I, to those of you who love Hashem with all your heart, I hope something I've said here, um, conveys to you why it's important to read the Jewish scriptures in the language that it was conveyed, but the Almighty by the Almighty, blessed be His holy name. So, just just for for further clarity, because uh, people are going to call back and say, "Well, what about this aspect of it?" Now, I'm not asking you to repeat anything, but I do want you to summarize in like two, like one or two sentences, something a short, simple answer. So, is basically what you're saying that the reason why. Uh, it looks like to us that God changed his mind. It's simply a language barrier from the Hebrew to the English. It's just a translation problem. Is that Would that be correct to say that? Rabbi, are you still there? It froze up. Let me hang up and call him back. Okay, let's try. Pardon me, bear with me one second. We'll try this one more time. Call Skype. He was having internet issues this morning, so I'm not sure if it actually is kind of floating in and out. We'll wait one second. So we'll get further clarity on that. Uh, we've got other people calling in. Um, for the callers out there, when you do call in, um, if you call in while someone else is actually on hold, uh, we won't be able to actually connect you but you can leave a message for a later time um it may be weeks later but (laughs) we do it does save the voicemails for us to follow along with though okay it looks like i'm not able to reach him back his internet may have just shut down let me try one more time so um and also just a reminder when you do call in uh, be, be prepared to wait online for a while just in case if you just called right when we began talking and also for all the viewers out there uh maybe once oh there he is let's see if this is it right here answer all right there we go all right, all right. we're back we're back okay so, good i think we got you live okay super 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 let's see why does it say the other party can't oh that's good Okay, wonderful. Okay, so to basically what we're trying to do right now before we move on to this next caller is uh, just in one or two sentences, just summarize. Are you saying that uh, the reason why it seems to us or by the text in English that God is changing his mind over and over again, yet he says that don't change his mind, that he doesn't change his mind, are you saying it's simply a language barrier, that it's just a, a bad translation um, and the to, to kind of close in more, if he does change his mind, it does seem to me that maybe he only changes his mind whenever uh, whenever it comes to something negative he's going to pull upon somebody. He will come back and say, I changed my mind. I don't know. I'm just throwing things out there. But we definitely, in a short sentence, something that the watcher can say when somebody says, hey, God changed his mind here, they can say like in one or two sentences how to clear it up the best they can. Cha- okay. So therefore, I, I changed my mind in a conventional sense means that although the factors remain the same, 
um, I'm going to give a new rendition. I'm going to do something different. I'm just because what I had thought previously wasn't a good thought, and now there's a new thought. There's a new information, and based on that new information or or reconsideration of the facts before me, I'm going to do something different. God cannot do that. God would not do that. God is omniscient. Um, what Moses put forward was that his unique defense was that the that there, there are completely different factors here, and those factors is the glory of Hashem, that his name will be raised above every other name. And there were two reasons why Moses put forward that God's anger should not burn against the Jewish people to destroy them. Number one, the nations would say, because they weren't privy to this whole conversation. They'll never find out about it. So, although the, God brought the Jewish people to the wilderness only to destroy them, so that would not raise up Hashem's name. Moreover, that God made a, bl- a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that promise was that a great nation would come out of Egypt and would come into the promised land. And if that promise is not kept, that would again diminish from the glory of Hashem. So that's a completely new consideration. And then it's Lama, to what purpose? And look what would happen. And once you are now placing before God the glory of Hashem that would be diminished by, uh, by, the, by, by the nations of the world, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu, blessed be his name, changes and says, okay, then in those conditions, things are going to change. And Hashem did not wipe out the nation of Israel. It did change the relationship. It injured the relationship deeply, but that's not really the question. Mm. Moshe Rabbeinu ultimately is going to go down and see the very extent of the damage that's been done, very specifically that the nation was was rejoicing with the golden calf, which was beyond Moses. That's something that Moses didn't even know. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. Let's take this next caller. Uh, caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Please turn down your monitor, if you don't mind. Shalom, this is Rory. Hi, Rory. Um, I, I am, I am calling from Virginia, Bedford, Virginia, and my father is Jason. Oh, very good, very good. Okay, so. And I, and I was wondering, does the Torah say anything about that? Is it wrong uh, to fish? for sport or fish or hunt for sport even if it's unclean meat you know that's a really awesome question i have honestly we've been in doing the show for two years and that question has never come up before that's that's pretty cool okay fishing or hunting for sport excellent well, i think what you mean is that is it permitted to hunt for just just because it's a sport and the answer to that question is it's no, it's forbidden. Uh, you're only allowed to hunt animals for the purpose of its meat or its uh, hide. Um, you're, we, man was never given permission. If you take a look at Genesis 9, man was never given permission to kill an animal for sport. And it's absolutely forbidden to engage in sport hunting. Uh, 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 no religious Jew would ever engage in that kind of practice of just killing an animal uh, as a trophy. I, I And I will say this in addition to this. Now, I'm not talking about killing an animal, uh, a person who's, um, if a person wants to trap an animal in order to slaughter it properly, of course, that's fine. Uh, but not not to kill it, just the sport. And this dentist in, from Minnesota, I don't know his name, who somehow who went to Africa and just killed a lion for the sake of killing a lion, right. I, I don't even understand. I, I, I'm being frank with you. I watch that, and I, I'm just, I'm horrified by people who think that Killing animals for sport is somehow okay. It it just makes no sense to me. It 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 
um, but no, we weren't given reassurance. We weren't given permission to go around killing animals for no reason. We could, if an animal is a poses a danger, that's a different thing. If a, if you need its hide or its meat, of course, huh? we're given permission. You have to kill an animal properly. Go to Deuteronomy twelve twenty one, and so on. But uh, to go kill an animal mm-hmm. for sport is absolutely forbidden. What about the fishing? She mentioned fishing, and there's a lot of yeah, people like because so, that's not killing them. And and they say, I think what I've heard too is that uh, when the hook goes into the, their whatever the, the skin or cartilage, I don't know if it's painful. I'm not really sure, but like in bass tournaments and stuff, they always release the fish. So from what I understand, anyway. So is that something? Yes. That's so marginal? technically speaking, fishing is permitted. Okay. And that is that. Um, there's a lot of scientific studies on do fish feel pain and um, they obviously don't want to be caught and they obviously are, don't want metal going through their mouth <laughs> uh, everything inside of me goes that's a terrible awful thing to do um, but technically the laws of Tsar Balachayim and, and all the laws of slaughtering and so on do not Tsar Balachayim I should translate is causing pain to an animal technically in jewish law does not does not apply to fish gotcha. and in fact we, we we can kill a fish in any way we wish and i remember my grandmother blessed memory when she'd make fish she'd get live fish and they'd be in the bathtub she'd make a filter fish and she'd pound them over the head and i would <laughs> I thought that was just horrible. That seems violent. <laughs> I, it, it was. I just thought, my gosh, that fish is going to have a headache for a long time. But I, you know, as it turns out, fish, you know, fish are different. And they really are. I mean, they're different in many ways. I, I'm a diver, so I have a great appreciation for watching them and so on. I can't imagine just stabbing one and then releasing it. But as it turns out, I don't want to misrepresent Jewish law. It is I don't I don't think it's a good practice. I wouldn't recommend will do. But in Jewish law, it's permitted, and the, the laws regarding causing pain to an animal does only uh, re, re, refers to uh, land breathing animal, air breathing animals, not to fish. Okay, okay? gotcha. Um, all right, let's move on. There's there's so many questions that revolve sport. around this. I know. I think it's a crazy. Story. I just think pulling out, you know, putting a needle through its mouth and then pulling it out, and I just think it's. I I, I just don't understand the why people why this sort of violence is is a source of pleasure. I can't. But may, I I know some people are going well. Who are you to say? And maybe I'm not. I just I think about it and I go. I can't believe anyone. To fish for food, enjoy. Right, right. But to go and just for stab sport. In the, but you should know. But maybe I shouldn't say that because people are calling me not for my own opinion, but for Jewish law. So the truth is, in Jewish law, you're absolutely allowed to fish, and then throw the and then throw the fish back. Absolutely, the laws of causing pain to an animal do not apply to a fish. That's why you can kill a fish in any manner you want. There's no laws of that you have to sort in a way that's like we find Jewish law of shechita, of slaughtering an animal properly according to Jewish law, we're not told, just as one caveat, that the reason we have to slaughter an animal in this manner is because it causes least the least amount of pain to the animal. Mm-hmm. As it turns out, it does. And we can certainly conclude that shechita is in place uh, because the animal feels the least possible pain and the blood is released immediately. It's all our all our sages tell us this. But when it comes to fish, this doesn't apply, and you're allowed to fish. Okay. It's not against Jewish law. Okay, cool. All right, well, let's move on to the next caller. Caller, please tell us your name. Where are you calling from, please? Hello. Yes, you are live on the air. What is your name, and where are you calling from? Hi, this is Derek. I'm calling from British Columbia, Canada. Just greetings for uh, Rabbi Tovia from British Columbia. Welcome to the show, Derek. Thank you. 
Uh, hi, I have a question. If uh, I understand this can be a very long topic, but if maybe a rabbi can tell us when and how um, this get changed from the biblical uh, listing of being the Jews as our fathers belongs to the certain tribes and you've been uh, called by the name of your father to prove to be a Jewish as your mother was a Jewish. Oh, that's an easy question to answer. That's not going to take a long I time I understand this is the, the, the in the law right now, but this, the, I cannot find a biblical support in, in Torah where this being switched, because all tribes, all Jews being called and, and proved by their father ancestry uh, to the father of the father. And now, even if you go to, uh, to Bima in, in synagogue, you you are uh, you, you just call it and you are son of and by the father, but any discussion any conversation the first question if he, somebody wants to know know or prove if you're Jewish is are you mom was Jewish I, I I can't understand how this can switch uh, and still in the other institutions and synagogues and stuff you still have to kind of be listed by your father not by your mother. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, uh, Derek, oh. we'll 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 get this answered. This is yeah, yeah, this yeah. is a good one. Okay, thank you, sir. Bye bye. Okay, um, he brings up a really really interesting point. Um, is there somewhere in the Torah where is where one one of the scribes or one of the prophets illustrated that there was a identity uh, going through the mother? Yeah, of course. Okay, uh, the answer is it never changed. Uh, for example, in let's take Deuteronomy thirteen verse seven. Let's take the harshest. The, the harshest, I'm taking like the worst scenario. And this is, um, this passage is to provide a context, is talking about a fellow Jew who's an enticer, who seeks to draw you to idolatry, okay? So the Torah wants to tell you what is a Jew, okay? The Torah says there, if you look at Deuteronomy 13, verse 7, it says, Ki yosischo ochicho ben imecho. If your brother, the son of your mother, uh, seeks to entice you. So it says explicitly there that the way that person is your brother, meaning he's a fellow Jew, is if he's the son of your mother. It never says there if he's the son of your father. So if you share the same father but not the same mother, that means if let's say you're, uh, that, you're, that this person's father is Jewish and he's your father's brother, he's your cousin, but his mother isn't Jewish, then he's not a Jew. So this is just one example. Nothing ever changed. These are two separate categories. One category is how do you know you're a Jew? So that's through your mother. In fact, the... the the event that occurs with the just following it is the uh, the tragic case of a, a fellow whose mother was a Jew and she had a child with an Egyptian man, and it was a it was a disaster, absolute disaster. The Torah, but I should just want to explain a point, and I'm going to take one sentence to explain this. That is that Tanakh is very interested in disasters, and, and therefore it could give you a skewed view of what Jewish life is like. You think like life is just the Torah is not interested in things went well. It wants to look at bad moments so that we can learn from it and not repeat it. It's like when you go to medical school, you don't stand and stare at healthy people all day. They're looking at pathology and disease and sickness to know how to heal it. Okay, so that's really important. Okay, so, well, again, so we have that case, the case of the intermarriage. But the mother is Jewish, the father is not Jewish, the child is a Jew. The child doesn't have a place to live, this son of a Jewish mother, and he comes to the tribe of Dan, Dan throw, because if you don't have a, a Jewish father, that means you don't have a tribe. So he ultimately curses God. And it's a terrible situation. The result of it is not germane to this. What is germane is that you are Jewish if your mother is Jewish. Your biological mother is Jewish. Your father in no way conveys over Jewish identity. Now, there is another element of identity, and that is what tribe you're from. 
if your mother is Jewish, then this become. If your mother is not Jewish, then you don't belong to any Jew, no matter who your father is. But if your mother is Jewish, so then the question is, how how do you determine that your tribe by identification? Well, that's a separate thing. So one issue is, am I from the house of David? Am I from the tribe of Yehuda? Where do where is my tribe? If I'm from the tribe of Yehuda, then I get to live in Hebron. Then I get to live in Beth in Bethlehem. That's all in Judea. If I'm in uh, the tribe of Naphtali, I'm going to be living in the Galilee all the way in the north. I'm going to live in places like Tiberia, Tiberias and so on. Um, so what tribe are you from is something completely different. That means where, where is your Nahla? Where is your, your land? Where is your, where is your lot? Uh, if you're in Menasha, you'll be living in the Golan Heights if you're in western uh, Menasha. It was divided. That determination is made by the father. And that's a completely different series of passages. Very famous. I mean, the one that's easy, just really easy, is is Numbers. And how did a holy book get a, a name that seems so, un, you know, Numbers, well, Numbers begins with a census of the Jewish people. Um, but how was the census taken? Each tribe had a certain number of men that were assessed based on their tribe and that they were of military age. And it says there very explicitly that the way you know what tribe you're from is according to your family, according to your father's house. So we have two different identities here. Now, people, I, I've heard it said, ah, oh, yes, the Jews came up with the idea of you know you're Jewish by your mother because you can always be sure of who, you're, who somebody's mother is, but you can't be sure who your father is. Well, that's nonsensical. If that would be the case, then it would be the mother would determine the tribe identity. So, as it turns out, there are just two parts to your name. Number one, are you a Jew? That's only determined by your mother. Why? The Bible is silent on that. We don't know that. Uh, incidentally, conversely, in Ezra chapter 10, we have a, a, a another very bad situation where uh, more than 40,000 Jews come back to rebuild the second temple uh, under the leadership of Yehoshua and Zerubbabel. And when Ezra arrives later, or as it arrives in chapter 7, means he comes in a later flow of Jews because his, he was with his, his teacher. Um, as it arrives, discover that many of the Jewish men had taken for themselves non-Jewish women and had children with them. And he told them to send away, he, he put ashes on his head, he mourned over this, and he said, send away these the women, these foreign women, with their children. Now, if the children were, the children, all those children had Jewish fathers. If they were Jewish, because by dint of the fact they had a Jewish father, then why would the children be sent away? I, Jew is not allowed to marry outside the faith. But if the, let's say someone does. So if, if the father can determine tribe identity, then why were the children sent away? So the answer is, Judaism, nothing evolves in Jewish law. We can have a new problem, a circumstance that we have to deal with and address, but this, nobody ever changed the rules. I mean, then it's a fake religion. Only a fake religion has to make up stuff later. And therefore, it always was that the mother determined the Jewishness of the child, the father determined the tribe identity of the child. Okay, got it. Sorry. Okay, um, we had a caller, but I, I tried to answer it, but I lost it. Um, so let's move on into a question that came in uh, earlier. Uh, this is one, um, Psalms 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. This seems to show that God is speaking to God. <laughs> it's like God is speaking to God. Doesn't this display a complex unity in the text? Yeah, it's a very it's a important question because this passage is 
the reason why people get into trouble on Psalm 110 is they're reading a, a translation. And if you're reading a translation, you are a, a slave to the translator. It's just really simple. A translation, by definition, is the word of man, cannot be the word of God. And now, here we have a case where the translation wasn't just a poor translation, or as in other circumstances, there's no way to really properly render the text. But here we have a deliberate corruption of a text. If someone is reading the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, said to my Lord, capital L-O-R-D, this is Psalm 110, verse 1, they're looking at a Christian Bible, and this is a complete corruption. The text says, Mizmo Lodovid Um Hashem La Adoni. Now, let me just break that up for you. That a, a Psalm to David, Mizmo Lodovid, that the Lord... The, the first word, the first Hebrew word, even if you don't read Hebrew, that's actually the name of God. Yud, and then a He, then a Vav, followed by a He. That's the actual name of God. It's the most sacred name of God. Now, if you look at a Christian Bible, look at a King James Bible, the, the Lord said to my Lord, again, a capital L-O-R-D, Possible to deliver to be looking at a at an amplified whatever a living Bible, the uh, the New American Standard. They're the same, even though there's no even such thing as a capital L in the. There's no such thing as a capital letter in excuse me, in the Hebrew language. But they they're doing that for a reason, and if you're reading King James, you're in New International Version. You're, you, you're in an enormous amount of trouble. There are some translators who, while Christian, that are more honest. On this. I think the New Revised Standard Version doesn't engage in this stuff. The question is, why are they playing with this passage? Well, as it turns out, this verse is quoted in all the, in all the, the Synoptic Gospels, all have a story that we are told where Jesus challenges the 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 men of the law, meaning the Pharisees, the Jews, and, and challenge them, uh, who is the Messiah? Asking, questioning them, who is the Messiah? And they respond, he is the son of David. And then Jesus responds and says, but how is it then that David would refer to his son as my Lord? And we are told in the Synoptic Gospels that that they just didn't know how to respond. Now, we could be sure of one thing. That story never happened. Because in order to be baffled by this, you'd, you'd have to not read Hebrew. And you could be sure that the sages of Israel knew, knew the Jewish scriptures by heart. They, it was on their hearts day and night, and they would have never been fooled by this. This is a bogus claim, and it, it, it's given life. It's, infu it's injected with uh, meaning, and people actually buy it because they're, they are depending on, 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 the, um, on the translations. They're, they're depending on uh, William Tyndale. They're depending on Jerome depending on the the um, translators that were commissioned in the early 16th early 17th century by King James to render it so they they have no clue what it actually says now let's talk about what it does say it says the Lord said la Adoni la Adoni sounds very different than the actual name of God I'm not going to say it but you know it's Joe and you know the there's no J sound but we just don't ever say it, wow. uh, except on Yom Kippur, but we won't talk about that. Okay. We don't say it. So the key is that the word Adoni always means, without ever, without any exception, La Adoni, La Adoni, Lamed Aleph Dalet Nun Yud, with, a, with one dot under the Nun, always means, my Lord, and that person 
is not God, but it's a, a human being. And it's a statement, it's a reference of, of, um, of showing honor. Jacob referred to his brother when he counted him, and counted him as La Adoni. I can assure you that God hated Esau. Esau was no one's God. So we have this word all over Tanakh in every single place that it appears. It, again, if you look up that Hebrew word exactly in that spelling, in every other place, the same King James Bible will translate it as my master, lowercase m, my lord, lowercase l. It's a, it's a language of reference, but it's never capital L, only here. Why? Lama? <laughs> to what end was this? It's very simple. The reason is, is that the Christian Bibles corrupt these texts in order so that they comport with a, a bogus story in the Synoptic Gospels. Now, I said bogus story in the Synoptic Gospels, and I probably just offended a lot of people, a lot of Christians. And if you're offended, I don't know what to say to you. I mean, what, what kind of, do you want me to just be dishing out applesauce on the show? Do you want uh, the kind of music you hear in a dentist office? You don't want that. You want, you want the real thing. Now, let's talk a little bit about... Uh, and, and it, By the way, it, it, what, first of all, what's happening here? So, King, this is a Mizmar Ladova. This is a song to David. What does it mean, a song to David? In fact, the book of Psalms is said... The word psalm means song. Uh, Mizmar song will song sing it is this like a musical album that's coming out like what is the book of psalm like what how did the word song get in there what, what does this mean what is why why this why is this text called a song who's singing is there where is there music that comes with it a musical music sheet that comes with it so as it turns out because king david we are told in the bible engaged in righteous wars but Hence, that engage in war, even though these were wars that were committed, uh, could not build a temple. Okay. Solomon, however, David Hamelech, a blessed memory, was ha, had the opportunity to prepare the materials for the base I make the temple. Moreover, he also wrote the liturgy, the music that the Levites would sing in the base I make. In fact, many of the psalms begin that way. This is a psalm. The Levites would sing in the temple. So the, now, one other thing. Book of Psalms, like all the books in the Jewish traditions, it's not like King David is sitting back and King David is this great writer and he's going, well, I'm going to write a, a great, you know, you know, some great literature. He just writes it. And then later on, some Jews with big beards say, yeah, that looks good. We're going to keep that. that. That's a green light on that. Oh no, this is the word of God. It means David was not just a king, but he was a prophet. What David wrote in Sefer Tehillim is, is the word of Hashem. It's the it's heaven breathed. This David didn't David didn't go, but you know, Hashem, I don't know if I should do it this way. Don't you think no? This is he's writing the word of Hashem. Now, why is David given the mandate to write the book of the Psalms is beyond the scope of the show. But the key is that he is writing the, this, these songs so that someone would read later, namely the Levites in the temple, that they would read, and subsequently all of us, that the Lord, that means Hashem, God, said to, his, said to my master, meaning King David. So it's not the same. And, and then the key is that if you look at the rest of the passage, Hashem says, sit at my right hand and I, I will make your enemies your footstool. That means that you will defeat your enemies. If you continue to read Psalm 110, just keep reading it, just so you know that uh, nothing's taken out of context, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is assuring that, that David HaMelech Will that this one will defeat the enemies of God, and He will crush those who are the opponents of of God's covenant nation. That's the whole promise that the enemies of God will be crushed by this individual. So I wanted the point for Christians has to be 
take it to this point has to be taken to heart. If you want to say that Psalm 110 is speaking about the Mashiach, meaning the Messiah, then it can, then Jesus can't be the Messiah because he then will have failed at this task. The Christian exegesis of this text, the way this is uh, the way this is presented in the Christian Bible is as such that if this is the case, that Psalm 110 is describing the Messiah, then Jesus can't be the Messiah. Why? Because Jesus didn't defeat any, any of the enemies of God. So this proves, not only doesn't prove that he is the Messiah, it proves that he can't be the Messiah. Ah, he's second coming, second coming than anybody could be. That's all, that's all, <laughs> that's all silly. So therefore, nothing works, nothing fits key point is, you need to go to the Hebrew. And I know some of you are going, you know, Rabbi, this is a very serious issue. Because I'm, I'm standing here, staring at my New American Standard, and it says the Lord, capital L, said to my Lord, capital L, and they look almost identical. You know, some of them, they, they play a little shtick where all the words are uppercase, the other one, one of the first letters uppercase. But some of them are identical. The key is that they look the same. I know why Christians um, are sure that the Jewish Bible was all speaking about Jesus. Because they're reading these texts. It's, again, these texts are not, these Christian translations are not just, they weren't uh, using the best assets to render the Hebrew to English. They deliberately corrupting these texts. Now, the guys that are doing it today, like more modern NIV, it's not like they came up with it. They're all copying a what went on, what, whoever wrote the book of Mark, and Mark may have copied it from an earlier gospel that never survived. But this was an old bogus claim about the Jewish scriptures that crept its way into the gospels, and then what subsequently occurred was that all translators who would render these texts, it made no difference it was, if it was Origins, uh, Greek translation that would be called the Septuagint, whether it would be Jerome's so-called translation. Again, these are corruptions. Uh, Jerome uh, died about 420 in the land of Israel. Uh, it made no difference if it was the um, later translations. They were all, like, no translator, except for the more liberal Christian translators, can change it. They can't, they, their hands are tied. Because if the New International Version would, would render this correctly, and it would read, and the Lord said to my master, lowercase m, then what they're saying is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are liars. That the story is that we are told is fatuous. And it is, because any Jew would go, well, it doesn't say the Lord said to, it doesn't say the Lord God said to my Lord. So, you know, so, so therefore the story is, the story, we understand how it would make it into the Christian Bible, because you can be sure that the, the writers of the Gospels are not going to have a a conflict between Jesus and the the learned Jews of the law, and somehow Jesus loses an argument. Jesus does lose an argument. The stories are all written that the Jews are going, oh, he's so wise. Those stories couldn't happen because it is because back then people were uh, certainly would have recognized these two words different. They were speaking Aramaic. They were praying in Hebrew. They would know this would be a very, very famous psalm. They would reject it uh, as every knowledgeable rejects it today. So number one, the psalm is is talking about David. It's others in the temple who are saying this of David. In the Christian translations, I just want to recap, you won't tell the difference because the distinction, which is huge between the actual ethical name of God in Adoni, which is never, never, never about God. Don't confuse that with, I'm going to use this word, I normally don't, only in prayer, but Adonai, not that, it's Adoni. Don't mm. get full there. Got to look at every single part of the word. That word Adoni is always referring to a human being who is not 
divine. You will find no exceptions to this in any case in Scripture. But that will never be conveyed by the Christian translators, because they now are stuck with the Christian Bible. Because either they can write Matthew, Mark, and Luke lied, or they could just do this, and they, they they chose to go with the latter and engage in this. And two is if this is re, this is if this is referring to the Messiah, and in a sense it is. That means that King David defeated his enemies. He did do that. But ultimately, the final Mashiach will destroy God, the enemies, God, Israel, Gog and Magog. Uh, but Jesus didn't do any of that, and therefore, uh, that means he's not the Messiah. If Psalm one ten is talking about, if if Psalm one ten is talking about the Messiah. So what do I tell you? Read the Hebrew. How important is it? Everything's at stake. If you don't read the Hebrew, you're going to be in church on Sunday. If you read the Hebrew, you're going to be a Satan uh, on Saturday. There's a really big difference. Thank you. Very true. Very true. Man, that's wonderful. I'm looking at it. I was showing them on screen a little bit where it says uh, Hashem La'orani. Um, which is really cool. And I didn't know that either. The Adonai versus Adonai. That's, that's really... That's, that's pretty eye-popping. Okay. <laughs> All right. We had a caller. They dropped off. They stu- they held on for a while, but then they hung up. So we're going to go into another question. If the phone rings before, like in popular fashion, before I get to the end of it, we'll take the call. All right. So uh, the next question is, well, actually, before we do that, I want to do something real fast. This is something I usually do because I, I'm, I'm a very, very, very avid uh, Let's Get Biblical book uh, reader, <laughs> and so what I want to show you guys right now, you've already you've already seen it, you've already had it. Uh, some of you even own a set. Let me switch screens here. It may be a little blurry. It might take a second here. Come on. Okay, I'm got. I need one extra hand. If anybody out there could just stick your hand to the screen, I'd appreciate it. There we go. <laughs> okay, so here is um, the the book uh, set with Rabbi Singer. Um, I'm kind of showing it to you rather than just showing you the ad because I want you to see. The depth of how wonderfully big this thing is, and how how large the print is. Um, this is uh, in. If you don't have these books, you you should definitely seek to get them. And if you already have them, you should have an extra set on hand so that you could pass it along to maybe a, maybe a Christian friend of yours is starting to question things themselves. Um, so you can see here in the like the size of the print all over this place. Uh, in the front of the book um, is got topical index with specific page numbers, right? And if you can't find your topic, all you got to do is flip to the back of the book uh, where there's actually text, not the blank page. And you can see how wonderfully, how everything is in chronological order. It tells you that all the different pages that the, uh, that the verse is actually referenced on. And it's just absolutely amazing. Inside, what's really cool too, and this is another reason why you should listen to the, down, the, um, the audio files as well. See how uh, it's got the main text of the book up here, and then there's like these little diagram boxes down the bottom. Well... If you, uh, of course, the CDs aren't available now, um, but you can still download the the, uh, the modules, the audio uh, podcast things, on his website, outreachstudiosm.org. Just go to free audio, I think is what it's called, or something like that, and download these. Um, it'll it'll be they'll they'll go along with the titles, but then you'll be able to have he'll explain what you're seeing down here in this box on the CD. So the information on the CDs or on the audio on the audio is not the same information although it's discussing the same information. So if you do the audio with the book you're going to get twice as much of clarity uh, on on what the illustration actually is. Plus it's just really cool having uh, Rabbi Singer talking while you're reading his book. So it's kind of neat. So okay again outreachjudaism.org or amazon.com is a great place to catch that. So okay let's take this well, I think, uh, actually, we're going to move on to this next question. Somebody did call in, but uh, I, I must have been busy with my hands. So call back in. Phone lines are open. Uh, we've got uh, roughly about 20, 20 minutes left. So uh, we'll move on to this next question, Rabbi. Um, if, the, uh, if the Christian Bible was written by Jews, if indeed that really was the case. Okay, now I'm getting a call here. Let me do... Okay, let's take this. We'll come back to this one. Hey, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Oh, okay. Uh, I'll try this one. Hey, welcome to Tanakh Talk. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Yes, hi. Um, this is Beth in St. Louis again, and I just have a question about um, Holy Spirit. Okay. And um, does the word Holy Spirit appear in Tanakh? Um, I know in the Greek scriptures it is, you know, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, but I don't, it's not, and, and there's such an emphasis on Holy Spirit um, in the Greek scriptures, but in the in the Hebrew scriptures, 
um, you know, the emphasis is on God. It's on Hashem. Um, I know, I mean, we all know that Hashem has a spirit. Um, his, his spirit, you know, is breathed, you know, is how we um, came into existence. He breathed into us. Um, and it's more of a, it's more of a, a breath. It's more of um, I can't think of a word. Energy um, is the way it's portrayed in the Hebrew scriptures. In the Greek scriptures, it's portrayed as a as an intelligence, as a um, something that you know. It's it's the excuse that is given about why um, everything you know that's written in the Greek scriptures is is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, and then I've even been told this. I've I have been told that well. Um, you know, the Jews in the um, in the Old Testament, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I've heard that too. And I've never, I've I've never understood that. Right. So anyway, I'm sorry. I don't I don't want to take up too much time. But anyway, if if um, if perhaps Rabbi could just um, briefly explain the difference between the two portrayals of that, um, it might be helpful to some people. I think that's great. And no, I think the more time you took to explain it, it gives us a better context. So, by the way, I just realized, oh, don't good. don't hang okay. up. Don't hang up. By the way, I just realized okay. some of the callers, when they call in, I don't think they realize that Rabbi can actually hear you talking. Y'all could actually say hi. You can say hi to Rabbi if you want to. <laughs> hi, Rabbi. <laughs> hi there. I, I'm a little shy, but, but thank you. <laughs> what? You're Why? so full of it. You're not shy. <laughs> okay. That's uh, awesome. I just, I really... I really admire you. I don't, every time I call in, I start crying. No. Okay. But I really admire you and um, I'm very thankful for you. That's wonderful. As I am, I also. <laughs> and so many of <laughs> All right. Others, yeah. Good. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get off now because I'm, I'm kind of shy too. But, That's okay. <laughs> um, uh, he's just, he is so, he's so respected. Um, I've even got my husband listening to him. My husband and I listen to you. Uh, speak. I, I, I want to briefly make you aware of this. Um, you spoke in Manila to a Christian university, I believe. Oh, yes. it was wonderful. It was just, I've never heard anything like that before. Um, but something happened in the YouTube clip, and right when you were going to talk about the difference between, you said there's two ways a religion can come into being. And right before you were going to state that, it skipped or something happened, Anyway, you may want to go back and look at that video because my I, my you. husband and I were on the edge of our seats. Like, <laughs> well, what what is the two ways that a religion can come into being? And then it, I don't know how many minutes it skipped forward to, but we never got to hear the end of that. That's that's good to know. Okay, Beth, thank you so much for your call and your question. That's really wonderful. Thank you. Good talking to you again. Okay, bye bye. Okay, bye bye. Have at it. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, so the spirit appeared. Yeah, it's good. The Holy Spirit, the spirit. Um, um, there's, this is going to rattle off some cages for some, uh, people out there who, who may be tuning in, who are Christian. Um, and just to, just to, to call out specifically one particular viewer, John Anon, uh, he's been watching a lot of the shows lately and he's been, um, you know, adding comments and communicating with people on there. Uh, this will be something I would say, John, if you're watching right now, definitely pay attention to this answer. Rabbi. Yeah. So, uh, so we have in Tanakh the spirit of Hashem, which He blew into his, the nostrils of of our first father, and every human being has the spirit of God inside. Every human being, therefore, is creating the image of Hashem, and no other creature is. There, therefore, there is no other creature, no other creation of God, that ever believed in God. They're not wired for God because they're not, they don't have the spirit of Hashem that was breathed in them. It's just the voltage is not wired for it. The spirit of Hashem is not distinct from God, but it is the, it is our ability to, uh, to, to pick up the numinous presence of Hashem. Um, it's our it, the the spirit of Hashem is something that is upon us, and we want it to be very holy, and we don't want to lose that. In fact, when Jews pray 
we read from the book of Psalms, Psalm 51, Al tashlicheni mufonecho, do not cast me from before you, the ruach kochecho, and your Holy Spirit, al tikach mimeni, do not take away from me. Which means that we are, if you ask the question, where is God, it's really wherever you let him in. And when you let Hashem into your life, then the Spirit of Hashem is upon you. The Spirit of Hashem is the dynamic presence of God as we can apprehend Him. It is not distinct from God, as is, I won't say as is in the Christian Bible, because I don't, in the Christian Bible, the Holy Spirit really is very similar. It's a later Christian development to suggest that the Holy Spirit was distinct in any way from God. The only thing is that sometimes we see that Hashem places His Holy Spirit upon somebody and we apply physical laws of nature to this. Meaning, if I... Um, if I if I take this remote control and I place it place it here in this hand and it's not in this hand any longer it's now in my left hand if I place this here so now it's not in my left hand now it's in my right hand so these this this physical conventional laws doesn't apply to the spirit of Hashem because it's infinite. By Hashem placing His Spirit upon us, or guiding us with His Spirit, means that w that is the way we're able to we're able to pick up the frequency of Hashem with our neshama. Now, it should be said that the prophets of blessed memory were able to pick up a a channel where they're able to hear more, and we don't we who are not prophets rely on their words as was conveyed through scripture. Um, so first, I want to just explain what the, the Ruach Hashem is and what the Ruach HaKodesh is or the Ruach Kodshecha is, uh, which would then mean your Holy Spirit. And that means that when the Spirit of Hashem is upon you and it's holy, it means that you have been lifted up to Hashem and you are now in the service of God. It does not mean that there is another God. And I, I know the Christians watching this, you're nice people, but you got to stop with this, but there's a separate person. There's no such, this is some language. This, this is some professional Christian language. It does not exist in the Jewish scriptures. So the word, the word person, where there are three persons, well, where is this term person? It, these are, these are, the this this sort of new uh, ecclesi Christian ecclesiastical language had to be developed because the Church had adopted a doctrine of the Trinity, and Tertullian in particular, a Latin Church father of North Africa, had to explain how Jesus could be both God and man, and part of a triune Godhead. In Tertullian's understanding of that, uh, of how he presented it, uh, Jesus was not equal to the Father. Uh, interestingly, the very person who invents the word Trinity didn't believe in it, as it was later hammered out two centuries, not even uh, in the Council of Nicaea. But don't talk person if it's not in the Bible. What does that mean, person? You know, so what it is is those are those are not words that we find anywhere in Scripture, anywhere in Scripture. But rather, what happens is this is not complicated. Is the church is going to develop, and it's going to develop very, very quickly. It's Christianity is going to emerge initially as a monotheistic religion. None of the earliest Christians dreamed that Jesus was equal to God. Uh, Paul's writings are earliest, and Paul is describing Jesus as 
being exalted by God and given the glory that is given to God. But God has to give it to him. So he is not equal to God in no way in, in and is certainly not in Mark's gospel, which is an, an adoptionist work where Jesus becomes the son of God at his baptism. And once we find ourselves in the gospel of John, we're beginning to see that Jesus is now being elevated into a God not a God in the God the Father, but we will see in the prologue that the trajectory that where this is going to go. You know, by the time we reach a church father like Ignatius in the early second century, he's going to identify Jesus full blown God. Ignatius uh, never explains it, and there's no doubt that he didn't have the intellectual requisite to do that. But later church fathers struggled with this mightily. Uh, Tertullian, you, you need to know this. That the early Christians didn't believe that there was a separate person, that the Holy Spirit was distinct from the Father. It was, to them, this was the, I mean, to them, the, the divine inspir, inspir, uh, inspiration that we see in the Christian Bible and the Christian scriptures is one that is heaven breathed. And that's the Greek that you'll find in Second Timothy three fifteen and sixteen, and, and in other passages. But now that that breath is separate in person than the Father, that's that's a much later concept. And then the notion that Jesus is fully human and fully divine, and therefore he has to have two minds. This is all later, later development. Now, what Christians will be forced to do is, when the Church will will continue to elevate the status of Jesus. In the canonical text, of course, the most highly exalted status of Jesus can be found in the first 18 passages of John. It's called the prologue, where Jesus is the logos, which becomes flesh. Again, it becomes, uh, uh, the, uh, the word uh, became flesh. So there, Jesus is coming from some part of the eternal past. But the full blown, blown, he's equal the father of Nicene Creed, that's fourth century. That's much later. Now, what the problem Christians are going to have, and the reason they're going to go to war with each other is they don't know how to work this through, because they're stuck with the Jewish Bible. Unless you are Marcion or a Gnostic Christian, they weren't stuck with the Jewish Bible. They hated the Jewish Bible. But the others didn't know what to do. They, they, Jesus is now elevated to the status of God, and then there's the Father of God, Jesus having conversations with the Father. Well, can't have two gods. You can only have one God. I'm not trying to sell books, but I have an enormous chapter on this in volume one of Let's Get Biblical. And they're all trying to come up with solutions to this problem. Oh, so the, you'll have the, we'll call them modalists. They'll come up with a solution that Jesus was, was fully God and simply God in a different mode. So I can be both a father and a son. I am a father and I am a son, but I'm the same person. Uh, so that was one solution that Christians came up with, and it was extremely popular. And we are told by Tertullian that there were bishops in Rome who believed this. I mean, popes who believed this. Um, uh, but Tertullian would have no part of it. And in fact, his development of the doctrine the Trinity was largely based on the rejection of this and trying to come up with some other formula. How do you have the Father as God, the Jesus as God, and the Holy Spirit as God? That was never the Holy Spirit part was never that important. I mean, it just was there, okay? Because the key was a triad in 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 the Greco-Roman world. The great gods came in threes. There was, there was the big one. But they came in threes. In Egypt, they came in threes. So uh, it's not an accident that Tertullian, a Latin church brother, is living in Carthage, where he is addressing these very important theological struggles of the church, and he's going to speak to the folks in his world in North Africa in a way they would understand a triad of God. So he'll come up with this formula Again, it's going to be developed. But as Christians are moving along, they're trying to, they're stuck with the Jewish Bible. And they're trying to explain, well, where do you get any of this in the Jewish scriptures? So they're going to scour 
the Jewish scriptures, come with anything that can remotely appear to uh, support these kinds of improvements, improvements in Christianity. Of course, they're going to go so far adrift of the Judaism that Christianity emerged from that it's not, it is, you can't even, you, I, I, I don't go to church, but I sure watch what goes on. I could see it on YouTube, but I could say there's nothing in there that any Jew would ever recognize. So look how far Christianity is, has gone. So the Holy, the Spirit of Hashem is the, the, the dynamic presence of God as we can apprehend it. God forgive me if I don't do this, if I don't convey this properly. It's hard to convey a metaphysical using language, uh, conventional language, but uh, a, a radio is not uh, picking up um, music. It's picking up a wave, that, and then it's translating that wave into a sound that we can understand in a way that we can actually hear it. Or a television set is now from some source. It's not actually, I Love Lucy is not coming through those wires, but it's all this digital information that's coming through. And then it's converted in a way that we see it and we can hear it. Okay, So there's an instrument that we can apprehend what is being produced. The spirit of Hashem, as we see it in Tanakh, is that ability that a cat does not have, and the dogs that we adore don't have it either. That is, they have no, if you could speak dog, if you could actually talk to a dog, and you explain to him about God, the dog would look at you and go, what are you talking about? They have no, they don't have that receiver. They don't have that ability to convert the signal the spirit of Hashem specifically in Tanakh is God through our system, our receiver, that we can receive it, that we if if we are in tune with Hashem and we can understand the message of Hashem through it. But it is not Chas Vashom, God forbid, a distinct and separate entity. And as I said, in the church this will develop and it will develop far. Now, the, you're going to hear, speak to Christians or read about this, the term of person. These are words. Just, I'm using the word fancy words because you know, it's not conventional, the word person. But these are words that the church will use, will manufacture, will, will massage, will shape in order to explain away something that's inexplicable. Oh, it's a person. I guess that's okay. Well, what does that mean? It's a person. What does that mean? Did, did Jesus have the mind of God or not have the mind of God? He, he, if, he, if he is asked uh, when is the end of days going to take place in Mark 13, and he's saying that no one knows that, not, it's not, not the angels, only the Father, that means he did not have the mind of God, period, end. That tells us a lot about an earlier, less developed, less augmented Christianity, less improved Christianity. So when, when you're being told about persons and all that, you know, almost that is, these are professional, this is the language of the church, but you'll know, find this in Tanakh, and, and know this, that when Hashem spoke about his nature, he spoke out in a, lot, in a way that doesn't require 15 professors. You know, I hear all the time that Hashem apologists say, complain openly, ah, 90% of Christians don't understand the Trinity. The only people who understand, apparently, are professors somewhere who sit and study, and you have to write 15 books to understand it. And and they admit they conceded up and down. I'm not going to name names. I don't do that. But they they complain that almost no Christian understands that. Of course they don't understand that. You can't understand it. It's a it is a contradiction, and it is a, it is opposed by the God of Israel. Hakadosh Baruch Hu tells us over and over that there is one God. Shema Yisrael Adinoi Lehenu Adinoi There is one, and there is no other 
Moses said before the nation as he stood uh, next to Joshua. He said that there is no other God besides me. He said that, and Isaiah conveyed that very clearly. Read Isaiah 45, verse 4, 5, 6, 40, 40. 6, 47, 40. I mean, if you read these chapters and you're a Christian, you're going, I mean, just prepare your resignation. You, you, you can't read these texts and, and then conclude that God wanted us to believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. And don't buy into these arguments that there was some sort of progressive revelation that although the Trinity is not in the Jewish Bible, it was a, a there's a progressive revelation. We had to wait 1,300 years to find out about this from the of the glorious church. God told us from the get go that you must worship me in truth and properly. I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt, the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods upon my face. It doesn't leave any a lot of room for Hari and Hanuman, the monkey god of Hinduism. It doesn't leave room for persons and triune nations, none of that. So, And if God wanted to tell us about the Trinity, he would have stated it. And I will say this to you. If we would have the Nicene Creed in the Torah, I would be in church right now, and so would you. The reason why Jews are willing to die than convert to Christianity is because there's nothing remotely resembling the doctrine of the Trinity in the Jewish Bible. Right. As it turns out, I'll just one last point, you don't have the doctrine of Trinity in the Christian Bible either. Yes, there are texts that are used that could be construed to, uh, to support that Jesus was divine. There are texts that can be. But a formula, straightforward formula, didn't exist, with one exception, and that's First John nine, uh, First John five, seven, and eight. But as it turns out, the text where there are three who bear witness in heaven, that text was a later invention. Why would Christian scribes? Everyone agrees that First John five, seven, and eight is a later Christian invention. That means that the Christians tampered with their own Bible. And the question is, what would compel them to do that? And the answer is, they had a big problem. The answer is that they were looking at a text of the Christian Bible and going, there's no doctrine of the Trinity here. If God wanted us to believe in the Trinity, wouldn't he put it in there? So they, they couldn't do it to the Hebrew, because the Hebrew was already fixed. The Christian Bible. So the Christian Bible, they stuck it in there. They actually stuck it in, stuck it in a Latin translation, let's say, probably in the 7th, 8th century. And then it made it it's in the days of Erasmus, who would publish the first Greek Bible, it then would slip into a um, into a, a, a Greek manuscript. It would, it would, the story I explained in the book, in my book. I'm not trying to sell books. I just, if you want to know, I can, this will limit how much. So the answer is the Holy Spirit is the presence of Hashem as we can apprehend it. The Church is going to divide the, the Godhead into three persons. What the word person means doesn't mean anything. It means only something to a priest or to a pastor. It's a, a, a whole new language that had to be manufactured to explain what cannot be explained. And to show you that what I'm saying is accurate is, when you look at the major wars in the church in the first few centuries of Christianity, what were they fighting over? What were they arguing over? What, when they went to Nicaea, when hundreds of bishops went, would fall to Nicaea, to resolve this issue, what were they battling about? What was the nature of Jesus? And what were they reaffirming in Constantinople? What was the nature of Jesus? Now, I ask you this question. If what all these pastors and apologists say is true, then it's, oh, it's clear if you open the New Testament, then why were they fighting? They didn't fight over the virgin birth. It's clearly in Matthew Luke. They didn't fight over the resurrection because it's clearly in all the Gospels and in 1 Corinthians 15. They argued over things that aren't in the Christian Bible, that had to be inserted into it. So the spirit of Hashem is the pres dynamic presence of Hashem, as, and, and please God that all of us will devote ourselves to Hashem so that the Holy Spirit of Hashem is, is apprehended by all of his people and will bring the coming of the true Mashiach, the behavior of Menu, quickly in our time. 
Yes, Amen, Amen, for sure. Rabbi, do you have time for one more question? Yeah. Sure. Okay, okay. This will be the last question. Uh, this is from a caller. Um, caller, please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Oh, I guess that was it. That may be our wrap. <laughs> all right, Rabbi. Well, I'll tell you what, it's been a great show. Uh, a lot of good questions. Thank you for uh, all, all the participation on uh, the YouTube chat. That's that's really cool. I've got uh, my uh, my wife is assisting me in the studio, and she's taking notes for there and helping me keep track of time. So uh, thank you, my dear, lovely wife. Anyway, um, and Rabbi, thank you. <laughs> I'd give you a big old hug and a kiss if I was there. Don't worry. So um, until next time, ladies and gentlemen, we will see you again on the other side. So uh, tune in about uh, two hours from now. We're going to do a weekly tour portion with Rabbi Manny Friedman. So Rabbi, love you so much. You're an awesome, awesome dude, and I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> awesome. <Hello. laughs> okay, good. Good, good, good. All right, let me get this thing right here set up so we can close this show, this show out today. By the way, you asked what the songs are. Uh, several people are asking what the song titles are and where they can get them. I sent one uh, message to someone saying to send you an email because I actually I don't know. You sent one, you sent the link to me a while back. Uh, I don't even know what this song is called, but I know I've been using it forever. So um, maybe you guys can. Rabbi, is it, where can they find Adon Alam? Just send from? me an email. Oh, just send me an email. They're not copyrighted. Enough. Okay, cool. And I've already I've already Toby, put your my email address is Toby is single one at AOL .com. Okay, cool. I have sent. Uh, I've actually sent you. Um, Actually, I sent them a message where it shows your email address there, okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, and we will talk to you later. Take care, everybody. Shalom, everybody.